propose to do is talk for about 30 minutes, then give you some time to discuss them today. Some of you in your work will have been in situations out of work where maybe you've been at the school gates, leaving a child to school, or you've been at a dinner party, or you've been at a conference, or you meet somebody on the tram, and they ask you what your job is. And when you tell them, they will say something to you like, but how can you mark art? Isn't it completely subjective? How is this possible? Well, what I'm hoping to do in my short input is give you some answers for the next time you get asked this question. The idea, I would be arguing that assessment in art and design is a social practice, a complex and artful social practice, and as such is a form of connoisseurship. The idea of art and design assessment as connoisseurship in the UK is not popular at the moment, it is not the mainstream thing, but I aim to offer a measured defence of this term. I see assessment as practice, and for Wenger, the concept of practice includes the explicit and the tacit, or, but more simply, the said and the unsaid. The said or stated might include the explicit elements that we can touch and see. So in assessment in any university or art college, this will include the regulations, the handbooks, the um, assessment criteria, the learning <coughs> objectives, things you can touch and feel, pick up and read. These are the externally set written documents that reify assessment. The onset or tacit elements refer to the ways that these documents are used in practice. This is much less codified and it's more experiential and it's the focus of my work. So tacit practice refers to the unnameable expertise um, and it's what Billet refers to as knowing in practice. Great phrase, knowing in practice. Now for me, our tacit ideas about assessment don't just jump into our head. Um, for me, this is social knowledge that relies on the community within which we work, the communities in which we work, and in which we assess student work. So in my view, there are large parts of assessment that are tacit, not fully articulated. And in the words of one of my um, interviewees, words fail me. You know, I cannot get it into words what I'm doing. Or, as a lecturer in one of my studies put it, when you see writing in red, this is from colleagues that I've interviewed over the years in a number of studies. So here, I think this colleague is summarizing how elusive it is to describe what you know. I'll give you a moment to look at that. And the example that's usually given, as many of you will know, for tacit knowledge would be riding a bicycle. Most of us, all of us can ride a bicycle, but if we had to actually explain to somebody why we don't fall off in very technical terms, we might struggle to do it because it's quite a tacit, it's embodied knowledge, it's knowing in practice. So, to use Pollyanni's phrase, we can't always name what we know in relation to assessment. So, on to my research. Over the years, I've researched a number of questions in relation to art and design pedagogy, but what most of them come back to is how might we understand art and design assessment? And my work is primarily focused on the lecturer's experience assessment. So there are other researchers doing fantastic work interviewing and learning about students' experience of being assessed, but my work is very much working on the lecturer's perspective. And it's worth saying, I've worked within my doctoral research was very much in fine art. I've done broader studies looking at art and design, and I've also done studies looking at performing arts, music, film, and media, and um, theatre. So you'll notice in my talk, I sometimes slip between talking about art, art and design, creative practice, and that will really refer to the fact that I'm referring to different parts of the studies that I've been doing for some years. 
And in terms of methodology, what I've mostly done is talk to lecturers, talk in-depth interviews over the years in a number of universities across the UK. But I've also, over the years, and I find this incredibly valuable time spent, sat in studios, either taking notes or recording, just hanging out in the studio as an observer, listening to <coughs> lecturers make judgments about artwork in order to help me draw out those main characteristics of practice. <coughs> so what I'm going to do now is talk about some key findings um, from these studies. And this is the overview that I will be working through. Somebody said to me in one study, we flood our assessment with students. And with, with staff, sorry, we flood our assessment with staff. Art and design lecturers often work together to mark artwork in the studio. And the fact that group work marking has still, is still such an important feature of art and design assessment in the UK, in spite of increasing student numbers, in spite of considerable workloads, suggests to me that group marking is a very valued part of art and design assessment and it, it is in part a way of defining the pedagogy and defining the practice because I suspect if it, hadn't, if it wasn't so important we'd cut back on that but actually it's an important part of assessment. In some of the universities where I studied assessment you may have a piece of artwork that has actually been reviewed and assessed by, in some cases, up to seven lecturers. Um, not always as many as that, but often. So this is in real contrast to marking writing, marking essays, which of course many of you will do as well as marking and assessing in the studio, where certainly in the UK when you mark an essay, mostly it's one person marking it, sometimes it may be double marked, but it would never in my experience, be seven people marking a written piece of writing. So there's something quite distinctive there. And again, I think another difference is, and again, I'll not talk for your context, you know your context, I can only talk for a UK context. In the UK, when we get double marking, two people marking for essays, we tend to do that for quality <coughs> reasons. We tend to do it because it's in our regulations, we need to do that. We don't do it because it's kind of at the heart of the pedagogy. So I would say in art and design, these moderation conversations, these conversations, these dialogues about student work in the studio are uh, a key site for judgment making. As one lecturer <coughs> said to me, assessment happens in the dialogue. So art and design lecturers exploit group marking opportunities to create and contest, to agree and disagree about standards. And in my studies, there were the following reasons why people were doing group marking. And again, I'm not going to read those out, I'm going to give you a chance to read them. Let myself a glass of water. So, the regulatory function of group marking was made very clear to me when one lecturer told me a story about an assessment uh, event that had happened in his <coughs> department some years ago. He talked to me, and these are his words, he talked to me about a, a sound art artist who one year wanted to fail all the painters. And when asked why did he want to fail all the painters, he replied by saying, painting has got no space in fine art anymore. We shouldn't, it shouldn't be there. Let's fail them all. Now, clearly, that art department didn't fail all the painters. And they had ways to regulate and moderate those views through the dialogue. And that lecturer's views were disallowed. They were not legitimated. <coughs> and that shows the way that the public market regulates and can, can constrain the kind of more um, extreme views that somebody might have to bear. And to put it more formally, Johnson talks about communities of assessment practice enable the discursive production of legitimated values. The discursive production of legitimated values. <coughs> 
Now, the ways that lecturers constitute the boundaries of the discipline was powerfully illustrated to me when a fine art lecturer said to me in a conversation, he was talking about a piece of work in a summer show, and he said to me, the work was either going to be a first or it was going to fail. And when I say that to people who work outside art and design, they just don't understand. They, they just say to me, how can it be it was going to be a first or it was going to be a fail? What, what does that mean? Well, Barrow talks about this and he says that often very high class, you know, high marked work in art and design is work that is testing the boundaries of the discipline. It's kind of edging at the, it's working at the edges of the discipline. And this was related to me in another situation in a university where there'd been a lot of conversation about one student's artwork. And really, what they were having to do in the dialogue about that student's artwork, they were deciding, is it artwork? The student was doing very unusual work with, with scaffolding and, and commissioning different people to do work with her. And they were really having a conversation, is this fine art? Does it count? Now, if it was fine art, it was utterly brilliant, and it would be a first. But if it was just something else the student was doing, and they couldn't recognize it as fine art, then it was a fail. And I think this helps to explain this slightly paradoxical view around marking students' work when it sits on the boundaries, sits on the edges of the discipline. The student, in this case, got the first. So they decided it was in the, in the discipline. And this reminds me of Foucault's point, where it, it, he talks about um, sort of the normal sitting within the discipline, or the pathological sitting outside the discipline. So in this slide, I've suggested that lecturers see group marking as a way to defend themselves against accusations of subjectivity. <coughs> And I want to look at this in more detail. I think this is an important point. Often, in my interviews, student lecturers worried about the subjectivity in their assessment. They were concerned about that. And sometimes they would contrast that to um, what they felt were more objective assessments happening in other disciplines. So I felt it could be looked at. The academics were, it was like the unwelcome guest at the party, the subjectivity. Nobody wants it, nobody wants that guest there, but it kind of turns up and it's there. And that really reflected the way that people talked about subjectivity. So if we look at this first quote, you're trying not, this is the words of the lecture, you're trying not to be subjective, you're trying to be very objective. But, like it or not, it's there, this unwelcome guest. And if you look at the second extract, look at the use of the word, you don't. It's quite strong language, it's suggesting that um, subjectivity in the academy, in the university, is seen as transgressive. It's disallowed, it's very problematic, it's dangerous. Those are strong words to use. Atkinson and Claxton argue that on rival subjectivity, is seen as something to fear in art and design. And in keeping with this view, my colleagues in different universities <coughs> talk about the difficulties with subjective reading. So if, in the extract I'm going to show you in a moment, a lecturer talks about the centrality of aesthetic judgments, but prefaces it with a view that it might be disallowed. So again, I'll give you a moment to read that. So again, hinting at this transgressive idea of wanting to assess in a particular way, but feeling that it's not viewed as acceptable, and that you may even have to pretend you don't do it like that. You may have to bury that. So 
the, con the conflict between how lecturers want to assess artwork and how they feel these approaches may be um, forbidden, if you like, is hinted by a lecturer who said to me, high quality artwork just makes you feel. Just makes you feel. A moment later he's saying, I don't tell my colleagues that when I'm in a meeting looking at justifying a mark when there's been an appeal. He realizes that in that situation of an appeal meeting where there's a disagreement or a complaint from students, <coughs> that saying it just makes me feel is not going to be acceptable in that situation. So the, the, the lecturer celebrates the emotional response but realizes that there are contexts in which that is not legitimated. <coughs> so lecturers are aware they need to represent their assessment practices in different ways, in different contexts. So in smaller teams, local teams, you may talk about the emotional, the affective, the aesthetic, but when you work in a wider university context, again, some art schools are part of larger universities alongside other subjects, then perhaps more objectivist, um, techno-rationalist views may come to the fore, may need to be foregrounded. So, the lectures, where have I got to? Right, no, I'm not there. So moving on. In the UK, it's become very mainstream and very dominant ideology to talk about learning objectives and learning outcomes. And this, you know, in the last 10 years, in all higher education, there's been a massive move. And again, I, I, I write about this. I'm not talking about the detail of this today, but I write about this in other places. And really, it's part of this uh, agenda to make everything in higher education transparent and auditable. And it's about a kind of transparency culture. Now, I, it will come of no surprise to this audience that trying to write learning objectives for art and design is hugely challenging, hugely challenging, and that many art and design lecturers find that it is a prescriptiveness that can close in around creativity in a challenging <coughs> way. So researchers and practitioners rail against what they see as prescriptive approaches to writing learning outcomes. So for example, Canatella, um, he writes that art and design lecturers welcome the unexpected, they delight in the unexpected from their students. And they want the work the students create to go beyond the brief, to go beyond the learning outcomes and the objectives. And Gordon, working in the context of media, as a media practitioner, she said that she wants her students to offer unanticipated outcomes. And she's written a lovely article simply called Wow, the Wow Factor. And she wants that to be the way her work, her student work is marked. Has it got the wow um, that would be hard to write it as a learning outcome? So in my studies, I find that lecturers were very dismissive when they talked about learning outcomes and learning objectives. They wrote them, they had them, but they weren't putting too much store by them. Um, so one lecturer said to me, the learning outcome is there, Susan, but it's only a statement. And perhaps that statement means different things to different people. So, on the one hand, we have a fear of subjectivity, but on the other hand, we have a view that the learning outcomes don't deliver objectivity. So when I was looking at this in my doctoral studies some years ago, this was the point I got a bit stuck. Well, yeah, what next? Where do, where do I go with this? And that was when I went back to Baudieu, Pierre Baudieu's work, and it was like, Yes, brilliant. This, this was such a useful theoretical frame for my, my studies. Because 
for those of you who know Baudier's work, and I'm going to simplify shameless, shamelessly for the <coughs> context here, Baudier views subjectivity and objectivity as mutually dependent. They're not an opposition, and not a binary. Um, it's not, is this thing subjective, or is this thing objective? The social world for Baudier is in the body. Um, and Bourdieu talks about this double truth, this double truth, which constitutes the whole world, or the whole truth of the social world. When we go back to the lecturer's descriptions of assessment, and we kind of think about Bourdieu's theoretical frame, then some of the um, narratives start to make sense. They start to have some shape. And for me, this is beautifully illustrated when one lecturer talked to me about something he called objective opinions. Objective opinions. Now, typically, an objective opinion would be seen as a contradiction. You know, like it's either objective or it's an opinion. But it's sort of, if you take this view that they are not a binary, well, yeah, we can start talking about objective opinions. This is subverting the binary between subjective and objective. So I'm going to put quite a long quote. These are, oh, we can send these slides around and put them on the web afterwards if people are interested in them at all. <coughs> this is a long description from one of my interviewees. And I'm going to encourage you to have a proper look at it because I think this lecturer um, talks very well about this idea of this informed subjectivity. So I'll be quiet while you're having a look at that. is the idea of informed subjectivity. It's not random subjectivity, it's informed and enriched and knowledgeable subjectivity. But again, we've still got space for that art kind of feeling. Still something kind of loose and elusive about assessment. So for me, this echoes Sadler's point. Sadler, <coughs> Roy Sadler has done many, many assessment studies not in art and design, in, in a, a range of subjects. He's Australian, based in Australia. And he talks about two kinds of subjective judgment. One kind is personal taste. Yeah. I like that, I don't like that. You're whimsy, individual choice. But there's a second kind of subjective judgment based on evidence and reasoning. So it's a rigorous subjectivity. And I would argue that my interviewee encapsulates that very well in that quote. So my next point is that I don't see subjectivity as inside our heads. I think subjectivity is social knowledge. So Godwin writes that sub the subjective views of the lecturer are not lodged in individual minds, but are lodged within the community of practitioners that work together. And Shay, who's done beautiful studies of assessment and engineering. Great work, really, really inspiring studies. Um, she talks about intersubjectivity, shared subjectivity. So for those of you who work in course teams, maybe a design team or a, a fine art team or a music team, that actually between you there is an intersubjectivity. A, a kind of, maybe the psychologists would call it groupthink. You know, it's a kind of a group subjectivity. So, the personal tastes and individual approaches are socially produced. This was underlined for me when one lecturer said to me, in my department, our views are weirdly similar. <coughs> weirdly similar. Now, if Bourdieu was here, he would say, oh, that's not weird. You're working together, you're talking together, you're producing social knowledge. Of course, there will be commonalities because you work together um, as a team over time. 
So the lecturers in art and design move across and between subjective and objective um, responses to the artwork. And again, I think these put it better than I could. Both these quotations from lecturers show me subjective and objective in one sentence. And I, I've used one of those as a title for a paper, because again, I think it's, it so beautifully captures that subjectivity and objectivity. So I think we can recognize and celebrate the subjectivity in our design assessment. We don't need to deny it. We don't need to see it as the unwelcome guest that sneaks into the party. We, we can be very positive about the subjectivity, and we can argue that it has rigor of its own. And whilst the lecturer may offer what appears to be an individual taste, in fact this, um, this decision will be co-constructed within a particular social, cultural, local milieu. And the, the decision making is, is framed, constrained and enabled by the setting in which it takes place. These are not random decisions, they are anything but random. So I'm now going to drill down into the particularities of fine art assessment um, and looking at students' practices and their artwork. So I take the view that students' identities, their artistic practices and their artworks are interconnected. And I would say that assessment is premised on that assumption. In the words of one lecturer, the work should carry the maker work should carry the maker. And I think what I really notice is that art and design lecturers are interested in the student's journey over time and their development. And whilst I couldn't understand the slides before me, I saw process product, and this is looking at this process product linkage, where we want to see the process, the development of artwork over time. And this leads on to my next, my next uh, area that I want to look at. There's lots of debate in the literature about the emphasis between process and product and when you're marking, when you're assessing work, how much emphasis should go on the process, how much emphasis on the product. And I think the, the red, the first quote there gets at this. You're looking at the journey of the student travel looking at the end point, but you're thinking about the starting point. And a focus on process is a very particular, distinctive feature of art and design, um, which is quite different to um, other disciplines, I would argue. And the second quote really underlines this focus on identity and intention. And I just think a little bit about intention. In the extract, the lecturer is saying that we need to, student needs to say what they're going to do, and then they'll be assessed in relation to whether they were successful or not. And one challenge to that was illustrated to me in a, a university I visited where two lecturers in two interviews coincidentally described to me the same student's work. And it was one of those pieces of student work there was a lot of discussion about. You'll know this situation. Somebody, there's something difficult in the work and there's lots of conversation. Now one lecturer wanted to give this student's work a very high mark because in their view, the student's intention was to paint a bad picture knowingly, to make a statement about taste. So the intention was to play with aesthetics of issues of taste. And it was a high mark because it was done very reflectively. Mm. The second lecture said to me, no, just bad work. The student doesn't know it's bad. It's just bad work. Uh, it needs a low mark. Now, for me, that tells us that intention, this marking against what the student intends to do, is just as tricky as marking the artwork. It doesn't make it easier. It, it, it's just as tricky. So I'll now I look at the relationship between assessment and identity. Um, 
For me, assessment is about becoming. Students' identities, artwork, and marks are discursively constituted. Now, what that means for me is that the artwork holds the identity of its maker, and the student links to the artwork. You know, the, there is a collapse between the identity of the student and the identity of, of the, the work that they produce. And I notice that when lecturers are marking in the studio, and maybe there's disagreement about a mark, that usually the voice that is most listened to is the voice of the lecturer who knows that student the best. So maybe three lecturers and they're deciding is it uh, A or is it a B? And the person who knows the lecturer the best is saying it's an A. Usually the group consensus will go to those who know the student the best. And there's been some research on this. Shea found this in engineering, um, Percy found this in crit assessment. And it's Wyatt Smith says the person who knows the student adds interpreted layers. We're able to give some context to the work, some context to the student. Now, in the UK, it's getting very, uh, there's a lot of pressure on for everything to be anonymously marked. You know, not mostly for text. You know, clearly, we have some subjects that cannot be marked anonymously, but it's a big pressure in the UK, anonymous marking. And of course, that is separate the students, separate the artwork, have them as two separate things. But for me, in art and design, it's the opposite. We want the students to know the students. We want the lecturers to know the students to know them well, and we think they have a valuable insight for assessment. And I, I would argue this is uh, a, a resistance to commodifying assessment, which can be unpopular in, in some quarters. What I noticed was one of my questions in one of my studies was I would say to the lecturers, talk to me about high quality student work. Tell me about it, what does it look like? Now, in that study, all lecturers replied to that question by talking to me about students. So I asked them about the work, they tell me about the students. And I think that just shows the collapse between the, the excellent student and the excellent artwork. <coughs> they kind of fold into one. So, my key point is that we're collapsing the binaries of process and product, artwork and student identity. And that really is my key argument about why we should look at it as an artful social practice. Assessment is an artful social practice. And that's in contrast to a techno-rationalist view of assessment. So I'm looking at it as connoisseurship, and I'm looking at the way that standards are established through dialogue and contestation in the studio. Talking about first-class work, a lecturer <coughs> said to me, it will have, this is his words, it will have that element of something you haven't seen before, which it sounds really vague, doesn't it? That thing you haven't seen before. Well, in my work, I say, let's call that thing zing. And I got, you know, the zing, where I've got that from is when I was doing my interviews, one lecturer said to me, first class work will have zing. And then he turned to me and he said, what the hell would that be? So he, he wanted it, but he knew he couldn't define it. Well, my response to him and my response to you is, let's not try to answer the question, what is Zing? Let's, let's, um, let's uh, allow it to be indeterminate. Let's give it permission to be elusive. The wow. Let's not try to catch it. Um, and we certainly can't write a learning objective for it because it looks something like this and, you know, I wouldn't let an objective like that in my faculty. I'm sure it wouldn't work where you work. But if we need to define Zing, I would turn to Matt York's work. Matt York, again, fantastic researcher of assessment. Not an art and design, but his work's broader than that. He uses this lovely phrase, Fuzzy standards, fuzzily shared. And he's not talking about art and design, he's talking about all assessment, 
from. He's a physicist. He's talking about assessment across all subjects. And I love this fuzzy standard because it's not, it's, there's some definition there, but the edges of it are elusive. So it's got rigor, but it's, it's also got a little bit of flex around the edges. Now, arguably, in higher education today, we can be castigated for saying we recognize it first if we see it. But based on my analysis, to a, cer to a certain extent, that was lecturer's experience of assessing work. And I don't feel lecturers should need to deny this. It's not transgressive. So I'm partly trying to rehabilitate connoisseurship and rehabilitate this artful practice. But I, I want to be really, really clear. I don't want assessment to be elitist, to be mysterious, or to be unaccountable. I don't want some kind of bad old days. Um, you know, I, I believe very strongly that students um, are you know, investing trust in us and they need rigorous and high quality assessment. That, that's their right, that's their entitlement. And there is, there are a number of studies that show you can view assessment as connoisseurship, but work very productively with students to help them join that community of practice. So it's not, it, I'm not saying it's totally mysterious and students can't understand it or we don't need to defend or explain ourselves. And you know, I'm not it's I'm not trying to be idealistic about art and design assessment. Um, McManus and Burke have done a, a, an amazing study where they sat in on 70, 70 portfolio interviews for students applying to go to art school in the UK, and they found some problematic, difficult, um, you know, potentially anti-equal opportunities, tacit practices going on. So, you know, I'm not complacent. There are challenges and we need to continue to improve assessment, certainly. So, I'm offering a measured and considered description of assessment. It's not a yeah, an ideal you know, panacea. So, human judgment, central to assessment. Not the same thing as saying it's arbitrary or without rigor. And the rigor is in the conversation, in the dialogue, in the communities of practice. And these layered, multiple interactions um, serve to put the lecturers, the students, and the artworks. They locate them in the discipline, in the universities and art schools, but also in the wider cultural arena, the cultural milieu, the contemporary art scene. So, to conclude, nearly finished. I've identified that art practices cannot be fully explicated or made transparent. Assessment isn't clear, assessment isn't transparent. It's messy and at times opaque. Marks are not measured, revealed, identified, or located. Art and design lecturers make marks. Thank you.